Hey everybody, it's Natalie McKenzie with The Whole Woman, and it's six o'clock here on the East Coast. That makes it quarantine time. That's right, get your tea or your martini. You might still be having eggnog after the holidays, who knows, but get your drink, hit that share button, invite a few friends, and join us. Welcome back from having had, I hope, a wonderful Christmas holiday. For us, we've spent it well with just very small family gathering of three. So I hope you've done the same, kept your masks, kept your distance, and still had a jolly good time. Today's guest, ladies and gentlemen, joins us all the way from the island of Jamaica. She is a wife, mother, master yogi, meditation teacher, wellness warrior, and author. Help me welcome the CEO of Sharon Fiani Lifestyles, Sharon Fiani. <laughs> Natalie, it's so beautiful to see you. Thank lovely, you. lovely, lovely. Welcome, welcome. Happy, happy holidays. Hope you had Thank a wonderful you. Christmas. Thank you. Yes, we had a wonderful time. And what are we on day three of Kwanzaa? I have to make sure I get the Kwanzaa yes. in there. Yes. And don't ask me what the day is. I just know Kwanzaa is all about unity, love, and community. So Beautiful. happy Kwanzaa. So Sharon, welcome. And how have you been? How have you been keeping during these COVID times? Wow, Natalie. Um, you know, I have to say, um, I have thrived. And I know that, you know, you say that because I have so much respect and awe of people who have really struggled during this time, people have lost loved ones. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I decided that my mission during this time was to not just myself thrive, but to help everybody that I can, not just survive this time. I wanted people to not look back at 2020 and say, oh my God, I survived it. I wanted people to say, I actually thrived. I actually learned a new skill or transformed in some way. Mm -hmm. So as challenging as it has been, um, you know, we're, we're all in this together. There's not one person on planet Earth that has not been affected. Right. Um, my, um, my three children are back home with me. I thought I was an empty nester this <laughs> year. <laughs> that it's actually the reverse. But it's actually been an incredible year for me. Wow, Sharon, you know, you've said something that is so critical that you want to get through this year looking back mm -hmm. and say, saying, I thrived. And my attitude to 2020 has been the challenge should really cause us to grow, to stretch, yes. and the discomfort should cause us to be better people and more conscientious of our front neighbors and really think about the stranger who you normally don't even say good morning to when you walk by. I think COVID has caused this to be somewhat kinder, though distant, in that you don't want to be touched. But I think that wearing the mask and going out causes you to make your eyes smile a little more because yes. you can't smile. It's, they Well, they don't see you smiling with because of the mask. So yes. Uh, I hope together our initiatives are successful for 2020 and 2021 finds us in a better place. Thank you. Well, it is a radical time of transformation. And if we can be part of that change, you know, and, and that change that we want to be part of has to begin with us, right? We have to become that change. And so having the kind of time and the whole new pivoting of the way that we live and how we operate and and what we want to do with ourselves now that the world has so radically shifted starts with us. And so that's kind of the work that I've been doing with um, my tribe <laughs> over these last months of this incredible time. So Sharon, you know, I'm curious and I'm sure our viewers are too, but what really goes into the making of a yogi instructor, a, a meditation teacher, someone who's been so committed to wellness and lifestyle. How did you get here? Where did you start and first start learning about yoga, meditation, you know, getting in touch with your inner self? Tell us about little Sharon growing up and where were you born? Well, thank you. So you're talking to me from Kingston, Jamaica. I am from, born as we say in Jamaica, born and grown in this little island. My ancestors on my mother's side go way back. I mean, talking five, six generations from Haiti to Jamaica. So France, Haiti, Jamaica. And my dad's side is from Scotland, God knows where else, and to Jamaica. 
So we, our motto here in Jamaica is out of many one people. Nobody ever looks at me and says, oh, you're Jamaican, you know. I am in what in a, is a very diverse island where we're 98% African. We are 1% Caucasian and the rest is a mixture of Lebanese and Indian and Chinese. And we're just this incredible melting pot of diversity and, you know, we like to call ourselves the One Love Island. So I grew up in a very interesting way in Jamaica. So my ancestors, my parents, my dad's side owned a sugar plantation. So I grew up right smack. If you're literally to drop a pin into the middle of this island, I grew up on a sugar estate there without phones, electricity or running water. <laughs> Um, and had the most magical lifestyle and childhood. I remember it would take me four hours to feed my animals every afternoon from school. I went to school in the local village with all the other kids that worked, or parents worked on the farm. Um, I played with my mom all day, and she was a big gardener, um, you know, loved to cook, so I was always with my mom. In fact, my nickname was Shadow. And I had this beautiful sort of fairy tale existence until I was about nine years old when ah, it wasn't the, the sort of village school wasn't enough anymore. We were about to, I was about to become the age of having to take this major exam to get into high school. And my parents thought the best thing to do for me at that time was to send me to a convent in Kingston. So an all girls School, which had a boarding school run by nuns called Immaculate Conception. <laughs> and so I was shipped off with my little barefoot fairy tale, magical self who used to talk to the fairies in the garden and had a pet imaginary frog and all my animals and just in this very creative artistic world into plop into this convent where, oh my God, talk about round square peg in a round hole or whatever you call it. It was tough and hard and I was so attached to my mom and this was you know it was this was a place where you only saw your parents once a month mm. and um I was there for five years so from nine till 14 those very formative years <laughs> took me a lot of therapy to get over it like I was like what did I do wrong why did my parents abandon me oh anyway the, the the long story it was shaman once told me that it was my spiritual initiation that I went there because that was the beginning of me tapping into spirit and i guess maybe in some way it was because i did find this incredible connection to mother mary there maybe it was because i was always in trouble always <laughs> doing something wrong and in punishment you had to go to the chapel and say hail mary's one thousand times <laughs> so anyway hail mary and i became really good friends oh. anyway finally Finally, in the 1970s, so this was in the 1970s where um, things were very politically um, volatile here in Jamaica. It was, we were going through major, major political upheaval. There was a lot of gun violence. Things were getting really dangerous in Kingston and sort of in the middle of a term, my parents plucked us out of that boarding school. My sister had joined me there at the time. I have three sisters. I'm sorry, I'm the eldest of three. And my middle sister and I went off to boarding school in Florida, a school mm -hmm. called Pinecrest. So here I come from this like all girls Catholic school, you know, white hair and a slip on the knees and, you know, a hat and a tie and all of this to so this like co ed, racy school where everybody, you know, my, they're all teenagers, but they're driving, you know, Mustangs and convertibles and doing drugs and boys. I'd never had a boy in my classroom in my life. I didn't open my mouth in the first few years. I was like, what? you know, I was like, where am I? I felt like an alien had plopped in you know, and everybody was very preppy. And I was, I didn't even know, like, I was like, mom, why does everybody wear these alligators on their shirt? I don't understand it. You know, it was really preppy. And, um, there was this one girl in the school that just caught my eye and she was like punk rock, had her hair shaved and these big bubble earrings. And, you know, I eventually kind of got some courage and went to talk to her and we became really good friends. And she was a day student and her early on in that term when I was very lonely and very homesick and very missing my Jamaican culture. I mean, they, in that whole school, when I was at boarding school, I was one of two white girls 
in my class form. So in my class form, there were, there were seven classrooms of grade seven, okay? In, and 40 kids in each class. So how many hundreds of girls? There were two white girls. And then I go to America and there are like two black girls in my whole school. And I, all I wanted to do was read with the black girls because I didn't want, I didn't understand how to talk to white people. <laughs> You know, and then, so I would go to these to the African American girls, and I would want to be their friends, but they didn't really want to have anything to do with me either. They didn't get <laughs> that to make it. They never understood it, you know. And um, so it's, it's I have a really interesting cultural background coming as a white person in a minority situation, and then understanding, you know, just it's just in this last year of this whole thing that's happened in America and this whole Black Lives Matter thing that it's kind of like come back into my consciousness of, you know, things that I went through being the only white girl in many, many situations. And, you know, especially in, in that boarding school era where, you know, in that boarding school of 100 girls, the school had much more girls, but the boarding school was 100 girls, there were maybe five white girls. And, you know, there was a lot of discrimination on that part and bullying and things that happened. But mm-hmm. anyway, it's all very interesting. But long story short, this friend, Victoria, I went home to her house. She invited me because I was so homesick a couple of weekends into the first term. And her mom took me to a yoga class. I was 14, remember? And remember, I come from this all-girls school where, you know, or a Catholic convent where everything was about, you know, Father God is up here and hell is down there. And God forbid you get stuck in purgatory in the middle, like the worst place on earth. And, you know, God was nowhere inside your body. And all of a sudden, this amazing teacher who I thought was so old at the time, she was in her 40s, and I thought she was ancient. But she said, you know, something about and drop into your heart and, you know, feel the presence of God there. And I'm just like, I just had this hallelujah moment, you know, at 14, going, oh, my God, he's or it or whatever it is, is right here. So that kind of stayed with me at 14. Of course, I'm in boarding school and, you know, I'm growing up and I'm a teenager and all the other things that were going on, but it kind of stayed with me. The very next weekend, my friend and I were at a um, thrift store rummaging around books and I found this book on yoga, naked yoga with all these naked girls, (laughs) these beautiful yoga poses. I'm like, is this how they do yoga? This is so weird. But what really got me was the philosophy of the yoga that I started reading and about the nutrition and about you know, how it related to all different areas of life and about the yoga sutras, which are kind of like the the version of the Ten Commandments. And it kind of just resonated with me and stayed with me over those years of high school. And then when I got to college, there was actually a yoga class that you could attend, you know, as part of your physical stuff. So I did that. And um, eventually when, long story short, but I eventually ended up- Where did you go off to college? Uh, so I went to Raleigh. I stayed in Florida. I was always running from the cold. I don't know how you do it naturally, but I was always running from the cold. So I, I actually never wanted to go to college. I begged my parents, but I wasn't ready. I graduated at 17. I was not ready for college. I wanted to do a year abroad. In fact, I was signed up to go to Spain for a year. And the sort of the week before I was supposed to go, my dad just calls me into his room. It's like, no, you're going to go to college. And you're not going to waste another year. You're going to go to college. And it was the only college I'd applied to. I didn't even go and look at it. And I ended up at this college, which was okay. Um, Rollins College. It did the job. They, I, you know, um, <laughs> there was not, it was a very small school. So there was nothing interest, interesting to study. I was not going to be studying ec- economics or, you know, math or English. So the only thing of interest to me there was anthropology and sociology. And that's what I majored in. Um, all the while studying yoga, but something happened. So during those formative years as a teenager at Immaculate and then going to this boarding school, I was a, I was a very overweight teenager. I was mm. definitely suffered with eating disorders. Um, food was kind of like my, the way that I coped with things, feeling that abandoned by my parents when they sent me to boarding school at nine and then going to the school where I felt so out of place. and. Definitely had a lot of food issues. And then my final year of college is when I decided, you know, I really want to study nutrition. I want to figure this thing out and, and make a change. And so I took a couple of nutrition courses and ended up doing an internship with a nutritionist. And it was like a light bulb went off for me at 
that final year of college and um, understood about food and started to, I bought my first cookbook called The Enchanted Broccoli Forest and I had just moved into my first own apartment and I started cooking, you know, broccoli and brown rice for my friends are like, say what? <laughs> and then, uh, you know, I started to really get into yoga at this point and then into fitness. So I really had never done any kind of fitness before because I was always so self-conscious that I was overweight and shy. And I'll never forget that day of being able to run for 20 minutes. Like I, I, I crossed that threshold of being able to run for 20 minutes one day because my nutritionist told me, you know, it's not just about how you eat, it's got to add the exercise. And so I was really trying. And that was it. Uh, that was it. I, it was like that year was when my whole kind of shift into wellness started. And it started with my roommate and started with my friends. And then I started to teach yoga to them. And that's when it kind of was, you know, became stirred Great. up in me. Um, but you know, I didn't, I, at that point I hadn't studied yoga. In fact, I, <laughs> I, uh, I had a little segue under this crazy hitchhiking trip when I graduated from college in 1986 from Rollins, which is just outside of Orlando, Florida. <laughs> I always had this very strange burning desire to go to Alaska. Don't ask. I come from the middle of this island, right? I never even seen snow in my life. And I had this burning desire to go to Alaska. And I had a friend who used to go every year and work in the salmon factories. And my parents were arriving for my graduation. I opened my graduation present with tickets to, for me and a friend to go to Europe for the summer. And I said, I've just been invited to go to Alaska. And they were like, ha, oh, that's so funny. Tara, let's have some more champagne. Like, yeah, right. <laughs> that's hilarious. Yeah, we'll see you Here she goes again. We are going to fly home to Jamaica, and then we're going to go to Europe for the summer. It's going to be all lovely. I'm like, no, mom. And at this time, growing up in the middle of the island, so my parents left, went back home after graduation. I stayed a couple of days. I suppose they should follow home and then go to Europe. And um, we didn't have a phone. In the, on the sugar estate. So we had to call this number in Kingston and then they had to broadcast a message over a radio phone to my parents at Worthy Park, which was the estate. And everybody on the estate had walkie talkies. So they heard every conversation that was meant. And I'm there in part of saying, mom and dad, I have to tell you, I'm not coming home. <laughs> I'm hitchhiking to Alaska. And I just heard my mom, stay right there, don't move. Hitching, hiking, in the car, and don't move, don't you move a muscle. This is off, you know, everybody hearing this on the estate. So I'm like, oh my God, she's like, I am driving to Kingston to get on a phone. We have to, they have to drive an hour and a half to get a phone, okay? They drove to Kingston to my grandmother's house and called me, like, are you crazy? What are you doing? I'm like, calm down, we're going to take a bus. We're not going to hitchhike again, like, all right. <laughs> anyway, long story. Wait a minute. Short, this hey? is Alaska. That, there is no land at a certain point, so the no, uh, hitchhiking to Alaska has me. Right. <laughs> this is just like, no, they, they, no, I'm in Florida, and I'm going to hitchhike to Alaska. <laughs> they, they just couldn't even. So then I lied, and I told them I was taking a bus. Anyway, I have a picture to prove. My friend and I standing on the highway, 104 outside of Orlando with our thumbs like this, with a sign like this that says Alaska <laughs> and a knapsack on my back. And 52 oh, different God. rides later, two weeks without even stopping in a hotel or anything. We just went from ride to ride to ride. And I could be here for five hours telling you those stories and more. We eventually got to Seattle, Washington. From there, we stowed away on a ferry to Vancouver Island. From there, we hitchhiked to the top of Vancouver Island. We stowed away in the back of somebody's pickup. And we went, drove their pickup. They oh, were driving I, their pickup on the ship. What do you mean? <laughs> you stowed away? You, you have to really paint a picture because yeah. you have to do this. It's so, like, it's so there's it's no so more land to hitchhike on. <laughs> yeah, because so you have to go, all the cruise ships to go to Alaska leave from Vancouver Island and go up the inside passage. So I had to, we had to get, Vancouver Island is like a no man's land. It's a logging island. Like, you know, there's like, in those days, 1986, not much going on there. And very strange loggers, like nobody's picking up on the side of the road. The only way I could get picked up was for the, the friend that I was with was a boy. At the time he was just a friend, you know, 
after a few months it came. But the only way I could get a ride was for him to hide in the forest and for me to put my thumb out on the side of the road and get a ride. Anyway, long story short, these California co cousins picked us up. They're like, hey, we want to go to, we're going to Alaska too. We're going on a cruise. We're driving the boat, the car onto the cruise ship. And, and when we get to the end of the cruise, we drive it off and we're going to tour over Alaska. So we're like, they're like, jump in the back. Let's stow you away. Let's pull you on the cruise ship. So they had one of those pickups that you lock down the back. In goes the knapsack. In Bart and I go. We drive in here, go onto this cruise ship. We're in this hull. And then, you know, when it came to dinner time, they came and took us, unlocked us out of there, went up, had dinner, had drinks. We would spend all day there and then we'd just go back and sleep in the truck every night. It was awesome. <laughs> then we went up the inside passage and I, I can just it. imagine your family. <laughs> oh my God. My father did not, of course, took his entire did not speak to me. And and of course we don't even have phones for me to speak to them, right? So they thank God for my auntie Rosie, who would send me a twenty dollar for every post office that she knew I was going to next. She lived in the States, so there was a $20 bill for me. And the rest of the time, I ate in soup kitchens. And that's probably why in my cookbook that I have so many <laughs> soup recipes, because <laughs> I literally lined up in soup kitchens. Because I, and I was the happiest person on earth. Anyway, we went all over Alaska, finally finding this salmon factory that we could work on, work in. Um, made $18 an hour, working from nine in the night till nine in the morning hauling salmon out, packing them in boxes, hauling them on trucks, and spent three months of my life doing that before I went back home to Jamaica. And that was, it was incredible. Uh, it was the best time of my life. <laughs> we need a whole show to talk probably about there, that. I'm probably, I'm probably near death like a hundred times during that. That's another story. Oh my God. But anyway, so um, even with all of that, it's kind of, kind of misadventure. I knew that when I went home, I wanted to be in wellness somehow. And I'd heard about a hotel that was just opening up the first spa hotel in the Caribbean called the San Susi Spa. And so I applied for a job and um, they said, fabulous, it's going to start in the end of September. They had brought in a spa company from Texas to manage the spa, but they wanted a Jamaican assistant to the spa manager. So at my 21-year-old self, after coming back from Alaska and cleaning myself up a bit, I um, got the job. But then they came back to me, this is September of, 20, of 80, 86, and they said the hotel is not going to be ready as planned for December. In fact, it's probably not even going to be ready till March of next year. So sorry, you have to go find something to do until that starts. And that was the Issa property, right? The San Susi Issa property. You, it was, at the time, it was owned by the Faces, Maurice and Valerie Facey. Oh, okay. And um, amazing couple. They brought in Aveda, the, the Aveda line. To the mm -hmm. It was so cutting edge for its time. It was fabulous. I, really I, met, I met Horse, Horse, who was the founder of Aveda, and first got introduced to essential oils, and which eventually I became an aromatherapist later on because of that inspiration. But anyway, long story short, what am I going to do with myself now? And um, having six months ahead of me with no work. And I, I was lying in bed at Worthy Park in the middle of the island and reading Seventeen Magazine. And in the back of Seventeen Magazine was this ad. And it said, Gloria Keeling School, strong, stretched, and centered, Maui, Hawaii. <laughs> Learn to be an aerobics instructor, yoga teacher, meditation teacher, Tai Chi, tai chi teacher, and raw food chef and i'm like that is me baby <laughs> so i got back the knapsack out <laughs> convinced my parents that you know what this is only a good skill set to have if i'm going to be a spa director and do this went out to hawaii lived out there for three months and became certified at 21 well it was a yoga it was a aerobic certification but she touched on all of these modalities and she had we were it was interesting because it was in Hawaii, it was young people from all over Australia, New Zealand, the West Coast, you know, very Asia, very interesting, diverse um, group of about 40 of us, all ages. And um, and then I went back and ran the San Susi Hotel. Uh, well, was the assistant director 
of this spa. And so I was teaching yoga and aerobics at the spa. I was creating the spa menus. I was, at the time, what I really loved, it was the first spa so was getting a lot of press and attention. Mm. So Vogue magazine would come in and Elle magazine and Vanity Fair, you know, big spreads about this spa. And I really started to love that aspect of it and thought, well, maybe I, maybe I want to also be in PR and marketing. So it kind of goes on from there. <laughs> Well, I'm glad. I'll take a step on my way. <laughs> I think the skills from Hawaii came good. All right, so let's talk about um, what ends up happening. How long actually did you stay at San Susi? And I mean, I remember San Susi. It was cutting edge. It was something yeah. to behold. It was beautiful. It went through its changes the whole nine yards, but it was truly one of our prides on the island. So um, awesome. I didn't realize oh, you've been involved with them. Yeah, that, that was a funny story. So I was, you know, they were bringing all these press trips in. So, you know, I was the one who had to like take all the editors from Vogue and Elle and all these places on their spa week and guide them and be their kind of point person. I was really like, I was loving that. You know, I was like, yeah, man, I'm big shot here. Anyway, the whole world changed because six months later, actually the spa director had an issue back home and had to leave. And six months later, they appointed me as star director. They thought I was doing such a great job. I'm like, oh, my God, these are big shoes to fill out, like maybe 22 at this point. Right at the point where I got this huge promotion, there comes a message in Jamaica that Tom Cruise is coming to Jamaica to shoot a movie. You're talking 1987 when Top Gun just came out, okay? Like, <laughs> like every woman on the planet was in love with Tom Cruise, even though he was only this high in person. So every girl I know was lining around the block to sign up to try to become an extra in this movie. Also, they were paying you to be an extra. You could hang out with Tom and you could be an extra. The movie is called Cocktails. Please don't watch it. I look so bad in it. But anyway, I go line up. Next day, I get a phone call. Hello, we'd love you to be an extra, but we really would like you to be the stand-in to the leading actress, Elizabeth Shue. I didn't even know what a stand-in meant, right? But I was like, <laughs> you take, who, cares, who cares about Elizabeth Shue? Tom Cruise? <laughs> yeah, well, you and me to be like in, when they create the set or, you know, the different scenes, you will have to be standing in for her and just be, you know, talking to Tom and, you know, like the scene in the bedroom, in the bed with Tom, just chatting until her makeup and hair is done. I'm like, sign me up. So I had to go to my boss. <laughs> was this horrible, strict English man and say, Mr. Kennedy, I need to talk to you. Um, this opportunity has come up and I am so sorry. I, it's, the, it's only three weeks. And luckily, it was like low season, right? And like, I will be back. I totally understand if there's no job for me when I come back. But this is Tom Cruise. I've got to go. <laughs> He was so disgusted with me. I don't care. I packed my bags. I head to Port Antonio where the movie was shot. It was supposed to be three weeks. It rained so much that it ended up being six weeks. I was paid 100 US a day, put up in the best hotel and hung up with Tom Cruise, teaching him yoga, jogging with him in the morning, <laughs> training him in the gym. I mean, hello. <laughs> You're living, just living the life. the life. So guess what? I decided after that that California is where I'm going, baby. <laughs> Jamaica couldn't manage me. I couldn't handle it. I packed my bags after that with my best friend and moved to California. Here she goes again. <laughs> so my parents are like, this is it. Rolling Stone gathers no moss. We're done with you. You're all going to California You're on your own, baby. And I was there for two years. And the first year was so challenging. I'm like... Sure, I'll get a job, you know, in Jamaica, you know people, it's such a small place, you know somebody that knows somebody that knows somebody, Absolutely. you can always rely on your contacts, we have no contacts out in California, right, I ended up working coffee shops, you know, and all of this, mm -hmm. but long story short, eventually one day, after sending out a million resumes, I got a job in PR for a very upscale PR agency in Newport Beach, California, so I moved up to Laguna Beach, drove up to Newport Beach and worked for this amazing older woman that had this very boutique PR agency. So we had accounts at Baden-Baden Spa in Germany and Cunard Cruise Lines and all this beautiful stuff. Long story short, 
it's election time in Jamaica. It was a pivotal election in 1989 or 90, I think, 89. And um, I decided I'm going to fly home and vote. Even if it's for the weekend, I'm going to fly home from L.A. and vote. Every vote counted at the time. So I flew home. I didn't. I got bitten by a dog. I ended up in a hospital in the middle of the most violent elections in the universe. It was a long story. But anyway, in the middle of all of that, I was asked to go. I, somebody said to me, Butch Stewart is looking for a PR manager. Sandals had just started taking off. He wants to set up a PR department. And would I go and interview? I'm like, Sandals? Are you kidding me? I'm, I only deal with boutique, high-end um, hotels. And, and no, no, not an all-inclusive couples only place. No way. Uh -uh. Anyway, she's like, you have to trust me that this man is amazing. And you've got to go. Well, of course, I knew who Butch Stewart was, but I had no interest in this. Anyway, it was my birthday, and I went to his office, and five hours later, I sat there and sat there and sat there, and eventually, I got this interview with him. And I don't know if you know Butch, Gordon Butch Stewart, the owner of Sandals Resort, but he is the most incredible human I have ever met in my life. And I, he, he just swept me off my feet and convinced me to leave this very kind of high-end cushy job and move back to Jamaica and start a PR department in Sandals. Mm -hmm. And I started that, uh, that was, would have been, oh God, 89 now, and, um, and became, worked my way up um, seven years later to become the youngest and only female vice president of PR and marketing for Sandals and had the most incredible career. And, um, personal growth on the Butch Stewart. And he, today I credit him with my entrepreneurial spirit, um, the way that I show up for other people, my dedication to my country, um, my work ethic is all about what I learned from that man. That's and so it was a fabulous experience. And, um, and that was the last time I actually worked from for someone. <laughs> then I... Sharon, we've totally gone over time and that's okay. We're going to keep going. Yes. Yes. There, there's a place we're, we're heading to that I so want to talk you to, um, so want us to talk about. Um, yes. It's the fact that you are, we're approaching the end of the year. You are embarking upon something so new. <clears throat> and I want us to talk about that. Um Talk to us about how you evolved because here you are, you with sandals, you start with sandals at its infancy and everybody now knows of sandals resort. They have properties all around the world, all throughout the Caribbean rather. And w being Jamaicans, we know it's our flagship for tourism. Mm, absolutely. So let's talk about how you transitioned um, from sandals to being Sharon Fiani, um, wellness, lifestyle, and how you've managed to author books. I saw recently also, you were featured as one of our most um, uh, impactful individuals in Jamaica. Thank you, the change makers, a beautiful book of- That's right. 100, yes, yes. So, uh, you know, I, there's so much we could talk about and one day I will write the book, but- um, so as I said, yoga was always part of my life. And while I was in those seven years working for Sandals and living in Montego Bay, I had amazing, amazing opportunities to learn to go to a yoga class with Dr. Tony Vendry. I don't know if you know who he is, but he passed away a few years ago. Mm -hmm. But he was one of the first sort of naturopathic wellness doctors in Jamaica. Fabulous guy. And he was also a yoga teacher. So I would go to his classes and eventually I was teaching while I was working for Sandals. I got a very long story short. Eventually, 1995, I decided I wanted to trade in my pantyhose and Ann Taylor suits and briefcase for yoga pants, bare feet, and a mat. And I went to Kripalu Yoga Center and became a certified yoga teacher. And in the same year, also became an aromatherapist. I had really been inspired by horse and the Aveda line and was fascinated by oil. And um, I felt in my heart that I, there was something that was guiding me to bring yoga to Jamaica. I just thought it was something that was going to be transformational. I also had had in, 
aspirations all this time to, as I was working for Sandals, I really wanted to be in tourism, wellness tourism somehow. In fact, I had the, I, the, the, the goal in my life, I was going to be the director of tourism for Jamaica. But always had this idea that wellness needed to be a part of it. So came back to Jamaica, actually started an aromatherapy company, the first in the Caribbean, Starfish Oils, it's still alive today. Right. Made candles, soap, body oils, incense, it was amazing. Sold that company and opened my yoga studio, Shakti Mind Body Fitness. So I, my studio was here in Kingston for 14 years. It was kind of a vortex here for spiritual growth, for yoga. It was also a fitness studio because I really, although yoga is, my life it's how i live my life it's the mainstay of my life i'm also a fitness enthusiast so it was a spinning studio yoga pilates zumba weight training everything and then my husband had to take a job in montego bay and that's where i met you right in montego bay you were staying a few doors down every year you would come and had so much fun meeting you there wow. and when i moved to montego bay eventually i had to shut down my yoga studio and that was a really tough time. It, it was my baby. It was 14 years. It was a spiritual vortex here in Kingston. It was a community place. It was just the most amazing little place where people, there was no rich or poor at my yoga studio. There was no black or white. There was no fat or thin. Everybody was welcome. It was just a melting pot of people who were interested in transformation and personal growth. And um, so when I closed it, it, it actually really broke my heart. And I went into a massive depression. Mm. And I'm there living in Montego Bay. And I was also at that time very <clears throat> stressed out. Um, my husband had moved to Mobay three years before to take this job. And I was figured we could just do this back and forth thing. And I was left in Kingston with a brand new baby. My youngest was only six months old when he left, a two-year-old and an eight-year-old plus this full-time yoga center, which is seven days a week. And I was exhausted and stressed and suffering from a terrible digestive disorder that nobody could figure out. So when I got to Mobay, I was like, I got to do something. I closed the studio and I decided to put myself on a detox program. I was depressed. I didn't like how I looked in the mirror. I looked like I had aged 10 years over the three years that my husband was away. Um, I had this disorder, like I said, this terrible bloating thing that was going on, an acid in my stomach, and no medication would help. And I decided to put myself on a detox. And I said, if Jesus could do 40 days, I can do 40 days. But it's not going to be starvation. I'm just going to eliminate some of the things that I thought was bothering my stomach. So I cut out coffee, mm. sugar, wheat, alcohol, and wine. Now, I was drinking two glasses of wine just to calm myself down. And I was drinking about five cups of coffee a day just to keep myself awake. Mm. I was a mess. I was a mess. I was a mess. <clears throat> but after those 40 days of eliminating what I now call the bad boys, and then finally getting some time to go into my kitchen. So I never had time to cook before. I relied on somebody to cook for me and whatever and cook for my kids. I got back in my kitchen. I took control of my kitchen. And I decided to start experimenting with things that didn't have wheat or gluten with them. Um, to shift up Jamaican foods and recipes that normally are delicious but not very healthy and make them more high vitality um, plant-based foods. And practice, you know, got onto my yoga mat, started to meditate, which I hadn't really had a proper meditation practice before. And really started to take care of me myself. And after those 40 days, it was like I had freaking transformed my life. I looked different in the mirror. My skin was different. My energy was back. My depression had gone. And most of all, I'm like, what stomach disorder? Nine months, I was the most uncomfortable human being. So sick in my stomach. That just disappeared. And I said, you know, if, if me as a yoga teacher, gym owner, owner, wellness warrior, could get myself to such a state from stress and anxiety and poor eating and poor sleeping, how many people must be like that? And how can I help them in this way with food, combining the food with the yoga and the meditation and so on? And my detox programs were born in Montego Bay. So instead of owning a gym, I now was working with small groups at a time, cooking all their meals, coming to my home. I had a nice big house, so they would come for yoga and meditation in the morning, go home with their bag with all their meals for the next day. 
And I did seven day programs, 21 day programs. And for those eight years living in Mobe, that is what I did. I started to get into nutrition. I started to understand more about high vitality foods, more, what, what did it mean to have more of a plant-based diet? And then how, when you married the yoga and the meditation with the nutrition and self-care, how that created this rapid and long-lasting transformation in people. So I really don't think of myself anymore as a yoga or meditation teacher. I think of myself as a transformational coach. And so in 2018, after spending, you know, like a good eight years of doing this, hosting people for retreats, you know, doing these week-long programs, either going to Kingston and doing them or going to Miami where I would be invited or Washington or New York or wherever to host these programs or having retreats in Discover Bay and, and um, Treasure Beach. I was kind of burnt out from, you know, cooking all those meals and, you know, all that traveling and being away from young kids. And I started to notice that people are beginning to put their programs online. And I was like, you know, this is kind of cool. What, what if I took my yoga detox program and put it into online format? How could that work? And so in 2018, I decided to do just that. I had no idea, none, that today the entire world is online. When it comes to learning, we are all online. And so in 2018, not only did I decide to do that, I decided to also write the cookbook the same year. That nearly killed me because I said, I'm not cooking for 40 people at a time anymore, breakfast, lunch, and I want to teach people how to cook for themselves. I'm no chef, right? So the work to put these recipes that were all here and scribbled on bits of paper into a book was a I mean, my poor kids, they still talk about that year. Mommy never picked us up from the school that year. Mommy never did this. I was just like, tunnel vision. I'm going to do this. That was so yeah. <laughs> I, oh, We are so over, but I, I, oh. I, we're having this conversation. It's okay because I, I want the value I want to leave with people is yes. and they can get the book. It's available yes. on Amazon. Yes. It's live Fit. Um, sh- okay. um, Live fit. live fit kitchen. Yeah, um, it's so important to do something like this, especially as we get ready to end this year and start a new year. And for the new year, you have decided to launch something else. The business you've pulled it all together. Yeah. Tell us about so, Shakti at home and how we can access that. How we can connect with you and probably engage with you for the new year. Thank you so much. And we have to have a part two, eh? Because people yes. love to hear the story of how you got there. So we'll do a part two, but Absolutely. very quickly. Starting, well, I've just finished a three month, what I call prototype of an online yoga, fitness and spiritual community. So it started in September and just ended last week. I had 45 women from across the globe. There were a couple of men in it too. And what it was was two things. What had happened is I'd moved back to Kingston. I had decided to take six months off to set up my kids back in school and, um, you know, arrange, just get back into life here and fix my house and all of this. And COVID happened. And like you and me and the entire world, the world came to a standstill. And I was like, oh, my God, what, I've, I have to help. And what can I do? How can I help? Come and leave my house. And I said, let me just pop up my computer. I'd done these online courses before, but I'd never taught yoga and meditation online before, you know, classes. So I just started to offer them for free. And that started in March. And sometimes, Natalie, I would look up and there were 400 people in my class, in, in my bedroom right here. I'm like, this is insane. And out of that grew this kind of different, people wanted to go deeper into meditation, they wanted to learn more about nutrition. They wanted to do my detox. So. This went on and on and people just wanted more and more and more. And eventually I said, I want to create this thing called Shakti at Home, this online community where it could be two things. You could just take the yoga and classes. I brought in instructors with me. I have like a strength training instructor. I have um, a meditation teacher, I have a cardio teacher, I have a a couple of other yoga teachers beside myself, amazing group. You can just do the yoga and fitness classes and wellness webinars. Or I can take you on a deeper coaching program where I help you to really integrate these practices. Um, So we ran that program for September to December with 45 women across the globe and a few men. 
And I don't know where this came from, but out of the sky, I get these things. A divine download came in and said, this program needs to be for women. Women are going to be the change makers. And I didn't know I was going to be in a book called Change Makers that I just got in my hands two weeks ago. That in this new era, in this new time that we are going into, women are going to be the leaders, the leaders of their homes, the leaders of their businesses, the leaders of their churches and their communities, the Sarah, leaders of their country. On, yes. on that note, I, I want to make a date with you here because yes. as we get ready to the close of 2020, I would love yes. to have you on within yes. maybe our first week of 2021 to really delve into Shakti at home. And I would yes. love to have the whole woman and you, Shakti at home, do something together because this is so in keeping with how I see us moving for 2021. And let's do a yoga meditation practice and then you know, let's guide everybody into. Okay. So how can we stay connected with you, Sharon, on, in, on social media? Tell us. Easiest on Instagram at Sharon Fiani and that's F E A N N Y. Or And if you click on that link and click into my bio, you can find all my information. It takes you straight to Shakti at Home, to the yoga, um, spiritual fitness community for women. It takes you into my cookbook. All kinds of things are up there on the bio on Instagram. So that's really my hub. And then, of course, the website is SharonFiani.com. Ladies and gentlemen, we have been talking with Sharon Fiani. Just a absolutely riveting story. We love getting, I love connecting with you. I think we forgot we're not sitting on the beach chatting with each other. I know. <laughs> I know. I'm, I'm sorry if I chatted your air off. No, we love it. We love it. But we're going we're gonna to get back together at yeah. the top of the year and we're going to actually get into some of the things that we want to do for 2021 to make us better people, better neighbors, better wives, better sisters, better mothers. Thank you so much for chatting with us, Sharon. It's been an absolute pleasure. We can stay connected with Sharon at Sharon Fiani on Instagram or SharonFiani.com on her website. It's been such a pleasure. Happy, happy new year to you. Look forward to seeing you in a few days. Cannot wait. Thank you so much for having me. Have a beautiful Our pleasure. Day. Thank you. Ladies Bye -bye. and gentlemen, so we are going to be uh, tuning out for now. I'm Natalie McKenzie, and I am the whole woman. Tomorrow, same time, same pl place, our guest will be Safia Styling Rogers, a boutique owner and stylist. That's tomorrow, same place, same time, 6 p.m. right here on the Whole Woman page for another episode of Quarantine. I'm Natalie McKenzie, and I wish you enough life to live, enough joy to give, enough love to share. I wish you enough. Good night. Good night.